on this episode of Unbeatable, Vince Hayfley talks openly about the word that most people don't even like to whisper in polite company. In fact, he struggled with this for many years. For decades, he couldn't sleep more than a few hours at night because of what he was struggling with. And then finally, somebody looked him in the eyes and said, I am telling you to go get some help. And after Vince went to get some help, he made a very courageous decision. I'm gonna let other people know I'm struggling. And what you're gonna hear in this episode is how radically different his life became after Vince started talking openly about that word most of us don't even like to whisper in, in polite company. Check out this episode of Unbeatable with Vince Hayfley. These stories of triumph over adversity will help you handle your toughest days in life and become unbeatable. Vince Hayfley, thank you for joining me on this episode of Unbeatable. Thank you for the invite. I'm looking forward to it. For people that are watching this online, they cannot miss the ginormous Ajax logo behind you. So why don't we just start with the obvious and tell people about the company that you work for, what you do for them, and how long you've been in the industry. Well, I've been in the industry since 1985. I've been with Ajax since 2002. Uh, I came here as a quality control manager. And uh, about a year and a half later, took over as the general manager of their plants and manufacturing and in 2007 became the vice president and 2019 took over as the president of Ajax. We're a family owned company uh, that originally began in the Detroit, Michigan area in 1951, came to Florida in 81. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Mike Coran came down and started the Florida operations. and. As of recent, Mike Horan and his family now actually own the company. All right. Uh, so uh, we're still a family company, just a different family. Yeah. About 500 employees. Uh, we have eight asphalt manufacturing facilities, four area construction offices. And we operate from up uh, north of Tampa down to Naples and over toward the US 27 corridor up towards Orlando. And... Uh, it's a great family business with not a lot of corporate policies. Awesome. Uh, you just described the perfect place to work for a fam a great family business without a whole bunch of, uh, you know, obnoxious policies. Yeah. Um, I was just thinking anybody who's driven down a Florida interstate, if that interstate is smooth sailing, you guys paved it. If it's not, somebody else did it, right? Is that what I'm hearing you say? Well, if it's on the West Coast of Florida, um, yeah. there's actually a lot of good contractors in Florida and we're all friends and we're all enemies on bid day and after bid day we all help each other so all right yeah are you a Florida of course everybody wants to know this question when you're in Florida are you a Florida native or did the business bring you down that way my brother moved to Daytona Beach in 1975 and at the time I would have been in middle school and my mother and father and I would come down two or three times a year uh -huh. In 1982, while attending Southern Illinois University, I came down on spring break. And after a week, the uh, guy that I came down with said it's time to go back. And I said, hey, I've met this girl from Michigan. They're going to be here next week. I'm going to stay another week. Yeah, okay. So I stayed another week and went back and finished the semester and came back in May of 82. And so I kind of tell people, it's kind of like a Chevy Chase movie. My dad picked me up at the dorms in his 1970-something green Buick Skylark station wagon towing my bright orange 1953 Chevy pickup with a yeah. Norton, Norton Commando motorcycle on the back of it, and he dropped me off. So I came to Florida in 82 and then began in the construction industry on the engineering side in 1985. What I just heard you say is you've been on a 40 year spring break down in Florida is what's been going on, right? 41 years now. So yeah, yeah. 41 yeah, year yeah. spring break. Pretty much. Yeah. And uh, that beautiful Michigan girl that you met down there, I guess she didn't put up a fight when you talk about the winners in Florida as opposed to Michigan. Well, after that week, I never talked to her again. Oh, yeah, of course. So that's how that ended. 
But hey, fast forward a lot of years, and I did marry a wonderful woman that was actually from Michigan, and uh, that's yeah. my wife today. Well, all right. Yeah. Um, how did you get into the construction industry? I had an uncle that always was in on the engineering side, surveying, so it always intrigued me what he did. I actually wanted to be an architect, and that's I went to school a couple of years in architecture and then just realized that wasn't for me. My mind, yeah. didn't, my mind didn't work right for that. And so uh, I got into uh, on the material side of the business, testing materials and uh-huh. just progressed from there and worked my way up. I came into the business in 1985, making $4.50 an hour and getting to work two hours a day. Wow. And now I'm the president of Ajax with 500 people. Yeah, I was going to say, you had a $9 a day job uh, back in 1985. Yeah. But I was asking the question about getting into the industry because anybody who's listening to this all around the world who's ever been to Florida in the summers know that it's just scorching hot outside in Florida. And now you have to add to that the fact that you're in an industry where people are laying boiling hot asphalt in July and August outside in Florida. That's about as close as you can get to the temperatures of hell on earth. Um, being outside laying asphalt in the summer in Florida. It's warm. I, <laughs> His comment was, it's warm. But, you know, we do a lot of things to, to help the guys. Yeah, um, of course. And either fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of work, our work is at night. We do a lot of government work, so a lot of the roadway uh-huh. work they make us do at nighttime. Um, and our guys were cooling towels. We have a lot of shade trees in Florida. Yeah, uh, we look out for them and we take care of them. But you, I mean, you actually do. You really get used to it. I mean, yeah, I know that's probably hard to believe, but you do. I totally know where you're coming from. Been outside in 130 degree temperatures in Iraq or Afghanistan, and you do eventually. The human body does adapt to those kind of yeah. uh, conditions. I didn't realize, by the way, you have a pretty incredible career in this industry. I didn't realize I was talking to the president. I should have stood up and saluted at the beginning of this episode. Yeah, well, I don't know about that. I don't <laughs> I don't really feel like I fit the mold of a president. Um, there's probably a lot of, of equals, my peers in this industry that would probably tell you the same thing because yeah, he doesn't he doesn't sh- shouldn't be president. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I, I've I've always tried not to be the smartest guy in the room. I've always tried to find people to be in the room with me that are a lot smarter than me to make me look good. And in all honesty, I got to where I am just through a lot of hard work and asking yeah. asking a lot of questions. Uh, by the way, you just told me without using these words that you are a very smart leader because the smartest leaders that I know are guys and gals that have went out and found people much better, much more talented, much more intelligent than them and recruited them to come work in the same environment and just created an amazing team. And that amazing team accomplished some pretty incredible stuff. All of the best leaders that I've ever met have that approach to leadership. No wonder you're sitting in the chair of president after many years in this industry. Well, I landed in the chair in a funny story. I, I came here in October of 2002 from the engineering industry. Mm-hmm. And in June of 03, I walked into the president's office and I told him, hey, when you're ready to be done one day, I want to be president. <laughs> you went into his office and said, I want your job. I love it. He lowered his head and looked up at me and he said, I have every young guy in this company wanting to be president one day. So I tell people, be careful what you ask for. That's right. You just might get it. You might might get it. Yeah. Well, I also do want to compliment you. We live in an age now worldwide where not many people uh, are in the same industry for 30, 40 years like you have been. And honestly, there are some things you got to learn along the way in order to be an effective president of a company of 500 employees that can't happen quickly. It really takes 
years, if not decades. So the fact that you've been in this industry for so long, it should make you well-rounded enough that you can be the kind of leader that all of those employees need. Well, I would like to think so. Um, people tend to gravitate towards me and not run away from me. I think I'm pretty humble. Um, you know, I get up in the morning and I put my pants on just like all the other guys do in the company. Right. And um, there's very few things in this company that I've not done myself at some level. So I can understand. Mm -hmm. I can understand their hurdles. I can understand sometimes when it is too hot, that it's time to call it a day and do something yeah. different. Um, I think one of the things that I have maybe is the president that some people don't have, or maybe they've forgotten. I lived for a lot of years, paycheck to paycheck, like yeah. a lot of those guys do. So I understand that life can be tough and life, there can be some struggles along the way. And um, you can't be successful if you don't help bring those people up with you. Yeah. For the people that are listening to you right now that are living paycheck to paycheck, and they would desperately like to be able to have a, a job with the kind of prestige and, um, you know, influence that you have. I hope they're being encouraged by what they're hearing right now. You went through the ropes. You did it the hard way. You grounded out year after year. And eventually uh, people started to notice your hard work and it made a difference. It just didn't happen overnight. In your case, it took a lot of years to get there. And for the guy or the gal that's working that paycheck to paycheck, you know, just barely getting by job, don't throw in the towel. Don't uh, give it up. Maybe grind it out. Keep doing your best and people around you will start to notice. And eventually you start to get more responsibility. And maybe one day you're sitting in the chair as president, just like Vince. Yeah, I mean, it really took me till I was probably almost 50 years old to where we didn't have to debate if we were going to go out and have dinner. Right. And not have dinner at home. Yeah. You know, and I, you know, we've had some people, I've got a good friend that's in this industry. And it, when he was in his mid twenties, he was making more in his mid twenties than I was making by the time I got to be 50. Yet he wow. was, yet he was frustrated because, because where was he going to go? And I said, you're so blessed to be where you are at your age. Yeah. Questioning, where do I go from here? Compared to being a guy like me that worked his butt off and it took 30, right. year, 30 years to get to where you got in five years. Yeah. Um, I'm just a firm believer. I mean, I hate to say the American dream because um, I'm not sure what that even means anymore. But I think if, if you show up to work, live within your means, plan your life. And there's a lot of things that goes into planning in your life. And mm -hmm. you know, we'll talk about my life here a little bit, the things, get yeah. in, the things that get in the way and, and obstacles. And you can go some different directions. And I went in some not so directions that weren't so well. It could have changed my life greatly, and they did. Just, hey, if you got to be there at 8, be there at 7.50 and be ready to go at 8. Don't yeah. be there at 8 and be ready to go at 10 after 8 when everybody's already down the road away from you. And uh, just work. Ask questions. Yeah. It's, it's really that simple. Well, I didn't expect this episode to start out this way, but I love what you're saying right now because at 30 years in – you're 50 years old and you're still wondering and you're given the job, everything that you've got, but you're still wondering, do we have enough money to go out to eat tonight or should we stay home and keep it cheap? And for a lot of people, they look at that quick instant success from the person next to them. They see those startups that become billion dollar companies overnight. They see that guy or gal that ends up making a truckload of money in months and they just throw their hands up on a career and go bounce from one thing to the next. I don't know if you're going to make a 
a truckload of money in 30 years, but I do know a guaranteed way not to succeed in life is to just bounce from one thing to the next to the next without settling in and given one job or one thing, everything that you've got. And Vince, you're an example of what it looks like when you just give it everything that you got and you keep doing it for more than 30 years. Um, yeah. You talked just a moment ago about planning your life out. And for the listener right now who's thinking, oh, this guy's had some hard days at work. They don't know your story like I've done a little bit of research and read. There's some times uh, you've hit some spots in life where life just threw you a curveball. You didn't see this one coming. And it went from bad to worse to I can't believe this just happened. Would you tell everybody about some of those family tragedies that you had, especially the tragedies that you just didn't want to talk about for more than 20 years, but now you're you're being a little bit more open about. So can you tell everybody about that back to back to back loss that you went through? Well, I'll start just before there, and I'll be quick on that part of it. I had a phenomenal sure. childhood with a great family. We had horses, motorcycles, ski boats, but my parents were some of those people that enjoy the boat over the weekend because it might get repossessed on Monday. They live paycheck to paycheck, <laughs> but I had a phenomenal childhood. And my parents lived their life that way, and for them it worked out because they both died young. And if they had saved all their money for retirement, they would have never enjoyed anything. Yeah. But, you know, so I have that great life up until 1989 in May. I learned my 36-year-old brother was terminally ill. Two months later, my father passed. Hey, for just a second, was your brother older or younger than you? My brother was nine years older than me. And how, how long between the time that you learned he was ill and the time that he passed away? He um, was just getting ready to turn 37 when he was pronounced terminal, and he passed away right after his 40th birthday. Wow. Yeah. I'm sorry I interrupted you. So no, you no, just no, learned that your brother's terminally ill, and um, almost immediately after this, say it again. In July, my father passed, and in November, um, my wife and I, we lost twin sons, one in November and one in December. So, you know, I, I did what my dad told me to do. Be tough, be macho, be strong, don't share your emotions, don't share your feelings. They take crazy people and they lock them up in Anna Jonesboro. Anna Jonesboro is where the mental hospital was, where I grew up in Illinois. So... Don't show your weaknesses. So that happened in 89 and then in 94. And my brother's, he had just turned 40. He passed. And we learned my mother was terminally ill with a form of cancer and she was gone. So by the time I was 33, I had lost my family, my entire yeah. family. And um, I didn't talk about it with anyone. Uh, I just played tough. I paid, played strong. So fast forward, I'm married through all of that. I don't talk to my wife at the time about it. I don't talk, when I say I didn't talk to anybody and tell them how I felt, I didn't talk to anybody. Really? I, put, I put on a front of being strong, but on the inside was just devastated. Yeah. So we, we get to the 2000s and I've already told my Quran that I want to be president of Ajax and my career is, uh -huh. my career is growing. Uh, my marriage starts to struggle. At, at work, I, I feel like I'm a rock star. And in my personal life, I feel like I'm a complete failure. I've, there's one funny piece that still haunts me to this day. I absolutely do not feel like I can load the dishwasher properly. <laughs> and, and, as, and, and as funny as that sounds and as weird as it sounds, in 2007, I started to take my life. And I'm, I think that night it was again over the dishwasher. Something happened at dinner or after really? dinner. Wow. And to this day, even with... My new wife of 14 years, I will make comments to her. I can't even do anything right. I can't even load the dishwasher properly. I felt like a failure. 
And after that night, when that happened, I got in my truck and I left the home. I was driving right out here behind this building, out behind our asphalt plant. That night I was going to take my life. And I got a call that said, we know where you're going. We know what you're going to do. And your son is on his way. My son was 18 at the time. Wow. And uh, so I did what my dad told me to do. I laughed it off. I joked. I played strong. I said, you don't know what you're talking about. I'm out for a car ride. I will be home in a few minutes. So I went home, took a shower, went to bed, got up the next day and went to work like nothing had happened. Mm -hmm. That day when I got to work, though, I sat down at my desk and I pulled my drawer open and I took four letters out that I had written. These were four letters that I had written to four of my most valuable employees. These were my goodbye letters to them. These were my thank you letters to them. And these were my letters. Wow. These were my letters letting them know that my decision to leave was no reflection on anything that they had done or had not done. So I didn't talk to anybody about that. My ex-wife knew. She was my wife at the time. Now ex-wife uh -huh. knew. My son knew. And I didn't think anyone knew. And I found out in 2021 that actually my daughter also knew. Wow. So from 2007 to 2021, for 14 years, I carried that baggage with me on top of the luggage I had from 89 to 07. Yeah. So I've got the 32 years worth of struggles and losses and feeling like a failure that I never shared with anyone and never talked with anyone about. Uh, I want to challenge people that are listening right now who have just heard you who are in the same boat. I feel like I'm killing it at work. Everybody's patting me on the back. I'm a rock star at work. When I go home, I can't uh, make my marriage work. My children are um, going crazy and I feel like an absolute failure at work. And therefore, I mean, I feel like a failure at home and therefore either A, and both of these can be bad decisions. A, I ignore my family life, my personal life, and I give my work life everything that I've got and I pour my identity into work. Or B, I just feel like I can't do anything right to include load the dishwasher and I don't want to live like this because I don't like who I am and I feel miserable and it can drive you to doing something like grabbing a gun, getting in the truck and going to drive to a private place where you're going to put the gun to your head. Um, Vince, yeah. you, you went through incredible loss in a very short period of time. It's one thing to lose a father, never going to get another father. It's another thing to lose a brother and then to lose two sons, twin sons within a month apart in the same year or find out your brother's diagnosed. That's everyone around you. That's your father above you, your brother next to you, your sons below you. I mean, you just lost everything around you, and it lo you lost it all in a very short period of time. Did people challenge you to reach out and to get some help? Because it sounds to me like you just stuffed that inside of you, and you tried to be that strong, macho man that you and I were both raised to believe. You don't show your emotions. Grown men don't cry. You don't ever you know, let people know that you're struggling. Did anybody challenge you to get some help along the way? Well, first, let me say there, there's a lot of people that have had worse things happen in their lives than what happened to me. To answer your, your question, because it ties into what I just said. No, nobody ever wow. said, talk to me. Nobody ever said you should talk to someone else. I was just... I was on an island that I chose to be on by myself. Uh -huh. um, there were people around me that would have talked, but I had a stone wall up around and I wasn't going to talk. Yeah. Um, if, if you fast forward to, to 21, I began talking about it because a professor at the University of South Florida, where I'm working on a doctoral degree, challenged me to do something more difficult than what I wanted to originally research. So I landed on this topic. And um, one of the professors there told me, I will help you get through your research on suicide, but you have to promise me you will go see a counselor. So until 2022, I had never really 
well, not really. I had never talked to anyone about all those events in my life. Yeah. And um, before I began going around the nation and I've been going around the world and giving talks on the topic, I would go to bed at 10 o'clock. I would get up at 1030. I would go set out in our backyard by in the pool until two or three in the morning. And then I'd go sleep wow. till five. I could only sleep about three hours a night on a good yeah. night. Once I finally started talking to people, I have to set my alarm now to make sure I'm up after <laughs> seven hours of sleep. Wow. It's, um, it's just like a weight of bricks have been lifted off of yeah. my shoulder. And, um, so yeah, anyone that is struggling, talking to someone is not a weakness. It takes strength and courage to do that. And unfortunately, I waited 32 years or 33 years to do that and only did it because a professor pushed me. Yeah. So talking to someone, we all think of a therapist. But there was a, there's other people you oh, yeah. you can talk Absolutely. to. Absolutely. Yeah. If, if I would have had another brother or sister, maybe I would have talked to them. Or maybe you have a, a pastor or a rabbi. I mean, whatever your real religion is. or Maybe you got a bartender at Cheers and you're Norm at the end of the bar and you talk to someone. You, you just need to talk to someone. It, it makes a difference. But then I would also tell you this. Be prepared for what you might hear from that person because right. it, may not, yeah. it may not be what you want uh -huh. to hear. When Dr. Walgamuth told me that she wanted me to talk to a therapist, I said, I agree, I will. The first meeting is to get to know each other, right? Uh -huh. Second meeting, you go a little deeper. It was either on the second or third. She said, okay, you suffer from depression, anxiety, your ADD, and, right. and, and there was a fourth. And, and I, gracious. I went home that night and I told my wife, I said, I thought you were the crazy one in the family. And after <laughs> today, I said, it was hurtful what she yeah. what she told me, because I said, I don't feel like I have ever had any anxiety. I don't feel like I've ever had any depression. I've been sad, but I don't think that was depression. Um. I know I'm not bipolar. I've never been medicated. I've never been medicated. I've never been an alcoholic. I've never been addicted to drugs. I've led a clean life. Um, not, mm -hmm. a, not a perfect life by any means, but a clean one. And so then in the next session, you know, I, I told the therapist, I said, I got to tell you, I didn't think I was going to come back because of what you said last time. And she said, we have to have labels. I said you suffer from depression. I didn't say you were manic, depressive, or off the deep end. Mm -hmm. So in my research, I have interviewed a lot of executives from across the nation. And one of the questions I asked for my research was, if I say mental health, what comes to mind? The first thing I typically got was a long pause. They don't know what to say. And then they said, well, someone that is bipolar or suffers from anxiety or depression. Well, that's not mental health. Those are mental illnesses, which are a subset, a piece of mental health, right? Yeah. So we need to learn to talk about mental health positively, just like we do physical health. Um, you know, I kind of equate it to two years ago, I hurt my shoulder. So I went to see the surgeon and he said, hey, I don't think you need surgery. We sent you to a physical therapist and we'll see how that goes. So I did, and it healed. And when I told people oh, I was going to see a physical therapist and not have to have surgery, I got thumbs up. You know, that's good. Congratulations. Yeah. yeah. Yet when you, you tell them, hey, they want me to talk to a therapist, it's, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, your brain's just like it's another organ in your body, right? Yeah. And um, Sometimes some people do need to be medicated. We've got employees here at work that we've helped do that, that have come forward since we began our journey here at Ajax. Um, and now they're leading great lives. Um, you know, there's other people that have just needed someone to talk to. And sometimes it's me. I've sat with two chairs here you can't see in front of my desk. I've sat in here with three employees, and we've all cried together. 
talking oh, yeah. uh, talking about the struggles, and that was their therapy for the day. It was my therapy for the day. So, yeah, you talk to someone, but be prepared for the answers you may get and work through those answers. And Vince, I want to come back in just a few minutes to your role leading a company and allowing people to be honest uh, with their Mm -hmm. mental health challenges, because that's difficult for a lot of leaders to do. Before we get there, though, what you're talking about right now, we just discussed in the very last episode, I was saying the exact same thing. I think I used the exact same words you just said about the strength that it takes to recognize I need to talk to somebody. I need a little bit of help. I'm starting to feel like I'm stuck. And I tried to say, I'll say it again. I'll keep saying it. It takes real strength to be the kind of man or woman who admits I need a little bit of help. It's a coward or weakness if you feel like I can do this all on my own because I don't want anybody to know that I'm struggling. But deep inside, you know you need help. That's cowardice, in my opinion. And I get the opportunity, not just in this podcast, but in the line of work I was in, in special operations in the U.S. Army, to be around some of the most incredible and some of the toughest men and women on the planet. And it's amazing to see how many of them today have said, man, I got low and I needed some help and I went to go see somebody and my life is much better today. Some of the tough, in other words, what I'm saying is some of the toughest people on the planet are the first to admit I needed help and I reached out and found somebody. You study this. Um, In fact, uh, it's because of some doctoral work that you really got deep into the weeds on this. You publicly talk about the stats here, but on this episode, I want you to let people know about just how severe mental health and specifically suicide is in the construction industry, the world that you've been in for the last 40 years. So can you describe this to listeners who have no connection to the construction industry? If you take today in construction nationwide in all phases of construction, vertical building contractors, road builders, utility contractors, just all games, on an average day, we'll lose two to three workers on the job. They may be electrocuted, fall from height, uh, covered in a trench collapse, some way they get injured and die on the job. That's nationwide. Two to three people a day in the yep. construction world die yep. nationwide. In that same world today, those same workers, 10 to 15, will die by suicide. We lose five times as many people or every five day. Five times as many to suicide. Annually, we'll lose about 1,000 workers to job-related fatalities, and we will lose in excess of 5,000 to suicide, and those numbers are underreported. Yeah. I mean, wow. I, I know I've talked to some insurance companies that go out and investigate job site accidents. And I mean, one story a gentleman told me from Texas, he said, you know, we're there investigating how this guy fell off of the building and died. And we just we could never figure out why he was working on the sixth floor, yet why he fell from the 27th floor. Yeah. And that gets classified as a job site fatality. It didn't get classified as a job site suicide. So those, the numbers are extreme. There's lots of reasons. One, we hire, hire a lot of military veterans into our industry. Yeah. And we, we know the numbers on those and yeah. things they've been through. Um, there's a lot of fluctuation between day and nights in our industry and people sleep cycle and get off. Oh man. A lot yeah. of, a lot of people work remote from their families for extended periods of time. So they work during the day and they go to the bar in the evening and they sleep and they work bar sleep and they get in dark places. Uh, but in my research, I think the biggest reason and I'm pushing back now on a lot of other people is uh, all not over 90% of the industry executives I interviewed, when I started telling them these numbers, they were shocked. They had no idea. Really? Yeah, we, wow. we knew we lost somebody in our company, but we just thought it was, you know, our company. We didn't realize it was an industry problem. So I'm really on a mission, giving a lot of talk to try to get the industry leader to acknowledge that this is a problem. Because, you know, the old saying, you can't fix what you don't know is broken. Right. And, um, I, and part of the problem is the CDC really, well, not really, they did not start recording the data 
until 2016. So the, the data on the numbers in our industry is really is new. But yeah, I mean, nationally, we lose about 14 per 100,000 in all segments of the population on average. And construction is up at 45. We're the second highest industry in the U.S., if you take iron workers, we lose about 70 per 100,000 compared again to 14 yeah. on the lower end. Uh, it's a problem. Uh, I, yeah. I I gave a talk last night in Tampa, Florida, and I had a slide that said this was my Tuesday. I'm in Washington, D.C. this last week and a coalition fly in. And I wake up to an email in the morning from a fellow contractor in Louisiana that wants me to speak to a group that he has that he's a mentor for it's up and coming executives now they're not construction workers but i got the message from him and one of the men in the group in his early 40s with two young children took his life over the weekend that was wow. that was at eight o'clock i went downstairs to the contractor meeting and they asked me to talk about the research and what i was doing impromptu i was there as an attendee but i talked about it and when I got done, it's now 1030, and a man came up to the room crying. But actually, a contractor up in Tampa where I was at last mm -hmm. night, he lost a worker over the weekend. Wow. So here it is, Tuesday, two and a half hours into the day, and I have two people. Yeah. That's just one guy that's telling those stories. Yeah. Vince, what you're describing in the construction industry mm -hmm. is tra every suicide is tragic. And by the way, when you say the leaders in your industry weren't even aware of the stats, that makes me angry. I've said for years while I was still in the U.S. Army, anytime there's a suicide and a leader didn't have any idea this was going to happen, that this might happen, I view that as a leadership failure. Don't get me wrong. Leaders cannot stop somebody who's intent on killing themselves. That's not what I'm trying to say. I'm saying leaders should know the people that they lead well enough to know something's not right with Sally or something's off with Johnny. I wonder if they're okay. I wonder if everything is going all right at home. And if somebody commits suicide or even the stats themselves are totally out of the blue, that's telling me leaders don't know the people that they lead very well. And that is what I refer to as a leadership failure. Go ahead. Well, well it, it is. I, I'm referring to the CEO, CFO, presidents. So, you know, sure, they, know they know they're pulled. They're the they're the five stars. They're not, right. they're not in the field where they're not the privates down yeah. there. Yes, of course. So, uh, we we have to get these guys. Yeah, and it, most of the companies that are now strongly addressing this that are doing great things have lost someone to suicide. Yeah. And, yeah. and in their defense, they have said, never again under my watch. Yeah. We're going Good. to do something about this. Um, the numbers that you just described, 10 to 15 a day are catastrophic. Um, like the construction industry, everyone that I know in the military has not just one, but two or three or five or 10 friends that have killed themselves over the years. And it's not how it's not if I know somebody, but it's how many people I know that have taken their own life. And one of the things that is bringing that number down, it is still 22 veterans a day that are killing themselves. But that number used to be 30, 39. And one of the things that's bringing that number down is leaders talking about it more openly. You're, you're not on this episode today, Vince, because of your doctoral research and because of your stats. I wanted you to be on this episode because of the very courageous decision you made to start to get open about it. So can you talk about the moment where you decided, I've got a personal story to tell here, and although I'm the boss and everybody looks up to me, I'm going to humble myself and tell people about the moment that I was thinking about taking my own life. Where did that kind of courage from, come from? Because most people, when they get to your, your place in life, they don't ever want anything to tarnish their reputation. So would you talk about preparing to tell people for the first time, Hey, I almost did it myself. 
I wish I had a great story to tell you. <laughs> the day I did it, I had no plan to do it. We were um, in our weekly meeting, 16 of the division leaders. We meet every Friday. And I told them that day, hey, on January 3rd, 2022, at our annual safety day, when we had the company together, we're going to begin addressing mental health and suicide as a company. And for whatever reason, at that moment, I decided to tell them my story from 2007. And um, the room was stone quiet. I can only imagine. I, you know, looked eye to eye with the people. I even told two of the people in the room there were letters in my desk drawer for you. There was no communication. There was no dialogue. There was only me talking. The meeting ended. They left. We did what we said we'd do on January 3rd, 22. I stood up in front of the company, said we were going to begin doing this. I've, I've been there. Um, and then the first time I really spoke publicly about it was in, I think it was March of 22, on a webinar uh, through the Women of Asphalt, the national group. Uh, mm -hmm. Cal Byers and I spoke. Cal's big in suicide awareness and opioid addiction in our industry. Um, and after I gave that talk that day, of which I sobbed through most of it, I felt a strength and power and a um, motivation like I had never felt in my entire life. I, I, wow. I had a passion at the age of 59 that I had never felt. Wow. I need you to say that one more time for somebody who's driving and just missed that comment, That uh, how much of a difference that made. Would you make that comment again? After I gave that webinar, I had a passion like I had never felt before in my life. 59 years old. 50, and for the 50, first yeah. time, you're experiencing passion like you've never had it before. Yes. Yeah. And it came through from people within two hours of, of the podcast ending, calling me from Connecticut and calling me from the state of Washington and telling me that one, one woman sent me an email. She said, I've lost several family members to suicide. I once stopped my mother. I've often thought, uh -huh. of, I've often thought about it myself. Uh -huh. And after hearing your story today and realizing that it can happen to someone like you, I no longer have to live in shame of my family. I no longer have to live in shame of who I am in my life. I, I, I tell people, if, if I was here giving you a one-hour keynote, there'd be a slide back here where there'd be pictures of me showing you as an 11-time Iron Man finisher. There'd be pictures of me up there with Mike Rowe from the Dirty Jobs guy and my wife. All right. Um, Pictures of me in northern Georgia in the mountains on Harley with my wife. Pictures of sports cars. To look at me from the outside, I think most people would tell their young children, if you could grow up to be like that man, what a phenomenal life you would have. Yeah. But then all that other stuff happened that nobody ever knew about, right? And um, I, The stuff that you have stuffed down inside yeah, literally yes. for, yeah. for half of your life. Um, and I credit Dr. Jen Welcome at USF for yeah. telling me to go see someone. I mean, I, there's an acknowledgement into her book that I, she'll be a lifetime friend and a lifetime professor. She changed my life. She encouraged me to go talk to someone. And uh, the greatest therapy I have had is standing in front of in Orlando on February 7th, in front of 1,900 people, of which probably 1,800 of them were men, and talking about the story and getting them to sign a proclamation. Um, I had industry leaders there from across the U.S. and manufacturers. You know, we had John Deere there, Dynapack there, Mark Merritt and Materials, all kinds of people. And we, they all signed a proclamation promising to me and the industry that they would go back and begin to have open and encourage conversations in their organization about mental health and encourage their employees to come forward and, and talk about it. And yeah. um, I call on them every now and then and check up on them to make sure they're doing All right. Good for you. So, yeah. Uh, but um, the, Again, I think I said it in the beginning. Everything that I thought would happen, just 180 degrees of, oh, yeah. of that happened. 
And um, you, you know what? If, 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 if somebody here at work wants to think that I'm weak for what I've said or what I'm doing, I'm never going to make everyone happy, right? But I, can, right. but I can tell you this. I have never had anyone in this company say anything negative. I have never gone anywhere to where I've given talks. And I've talked in front of over 6,000 people here in the last four months, four or five months. I've never had anything negative from those talks. I've had a lot of tears. I've had a lot of men afterwards want to sit and talk with me and tell me their stories and their struggles. And um, I, I did a little thing down in Fort Myers, and a young man came up to me, and he said, thank you for telling people here that everyone that tried to take their life is not crazy that sometimes yeah, they've just been right. hard spots yeah he said because i've tried taking my life before and he said it makes me feel so good to know that somebody knows that i'm not crazy and i was in a dark spot wow so I, talk i mean it's it's healing listen you're the president of a large company with a lot of responsibilities there's a million things clamoring for your attention and the fact that you would be willing to take the amount of time that you're giving not just having these talks but listening to people following up with people that are reaching out to you says that there is your life has taken a very incredible turn when you just started to get open about sharing your struggles and man i was just sitting there thinking for many people Public speaking is their biggest nightmare. So the very idea of standing in front of 1,900 people, 1,800 of which are men, would terrify the average person on the planet. But in your case, to stand before them and admit your weakness and challenge uh, people in the room, wow, that takes an incredible great deal of credit, uh, a great deal of courage. And I want to give you a lot of credit for this, Vince. Um you want to know how I, I want to know how I opened that talk? Sure, I'd love to because I may take notes and use this sometime. Yes, please tell me. I stood at the podium. I looked out in the room and said, "Wow, this is a big room." <laughs> but two minutes into the talk, I felt like there was me and about five other people in there. Yeah, because everyone was so attuned and listening. Yeah, that everywhere I looked, someone would looking right back in my eyes and I was talking to one person at a time in the room because yeah. people, I think people are really hungry and starving and wanting to say that I can finally talk about this. Yeah. Someone saying I can, it's okay to talk about this. Um, again, Hey, I, I have found my passion. Yeah. If you can make, suicide personal for 1900 people not only are you a very uh not are you a great communicator that can connect with your audience but also suicide has always been the word that people whisper in very delicate conversations nobody wants to talk about it out loud and the fact that you're having those conversations in an industry like yours because let's just be honest there's a lot of testosterone and macho bravado in the construction industry and the fact that you're having talks like that in your industry is even more impressive, man. One thing that I'm trying to educate people on and I, Hey, I still slip up on it. And, um, to stop saying someone committed suicide, Yeah, people die by suicide or people take their lives. Um, people commit, homicides, they commit burglaries, they commit robbery, they commit carjackings. Commit really indicate that the person did something wrong. And I think back to interviewing one lady and I made a comment to her about, you know, they say suicide, the most selfish thing you could do. And her son had taken his life because for part of my research, I interviewed a lot of people that lost someone. And she said, don't tell me my son was selfish because my son yeah. was not selfish. My son was in so much pain and aching on the inside that the only way he knew 
how to stop the pain wasn't taking his life. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, it used to in Western civilization, if, if, if you did take your life by suicide, that you could be, and you didn't, if you survived, you could be locked up criminally. La- labeled as crazy, yeah. right? So people don't commit suicide, they die by suicide. And by the way, I'm glad that you said this. You described yourself a little while ago as, you know, on the outside, you look like the kind of person that people would want to be. By the way, I didn't I didn't miss the fact that you said you've completed 11 Ironman triathlons in your lifetime. Wow, I'm very impressed. But um, I did an episode early on in this podcast with a friend of mine who is saying the exact same thing you said. He was married to an absolutely beautiful woman who came from a great background. She had everything in the world going for her. And then one day, as he's on his way home, he can't get in the front door because the police have barricaded it and everything else is uh, under investigation. And she's taken her own life. That episode with my friend Jason McKenzie is still one of the most often listened to episodes in this entire podcast history. And Jason said the same thing. My wife was the least selfish woman on the planet. She basically was the most giving person I've ever met. And she was holding on to struggles and hiding it so well that I didn't even know when the police were outside the door and it was already barricaded. I had no idea. No, it didn't even occur to me that she might have taken her own life. And Jason talks about what this did to him and how it impacted him. And then like you, Jason decided, I got to do something. And so he recorded a video, just threw it out there. And this video goes viral on social media. And lots and lots of people started opening up to Jason. But I want to remind the listener today, we're not just talking about suicide. What you're doing, Fence, and I hope every leader is listening right now is you're challenging leaders to create an environment where people can be honest about mental health in general, not just thinking about suicide or somebody close to me has taken their own life. And I think I'd like for you to kind of wrap this episode up by talking to families or talking to leaders who really struggle having this conversation They don't feel comfortable talking about mental health. And so they just ignore it like it isn't there or they treat it like it's there's a stigma attached to it. Would you help those people become a little bit more comfortable with having the conversation, having an uncomfortable conversation in public? What would you say to the leader who is who wants to know, how do I remove this stigma in my company? Well, I guess one of the first questions I would ask you is, would you rather have the difficult conversation or after the fact, ask yourself why you didn't have the conversation? Wow. Uh, which one would yeah. that rather be? That right there puts a lot of things into perspective. Uh, I would tell families that um, teen suicide is up, I forget the years, but like 150%. Um, yeah. When I was a kid, I told this analogy of being on the bus coming back from a baseball game and the sophomore on the varsity team, and I got hazed by a kid behind me that put something over my face that shouldn't have been over my face. But we got off the bus, we went to practice, the next day it was over. In today's world, that would have been captured on social media. Would have been oh, posted. yeah, and it'll haunt you for the next 50 years. They would have been bullied. The kids get in packs. I would encourage families when you go to dinner, whether it's at home or at the restaurant. I hate sitting in a restaurant, seeing a mother, father, and two kids, and they're all doing this. Uh, looking at their phone and not looking at each other in the eye. When you, when you sit down for dinner leave the social media away and actually have conversations and listen to your kids, ask what's going on in their lives, know who their friends are. Yeah. My wife and I always had the philosophy that we always wanted the parties at our house because we knew where they were and what was going on. And we knew what kids were there and got to know their parents through that. And for leaders, this is just going to elevate you 
to a higher level in the eyes of your workers. And then our industry, I, I, we here in Florida and the, and the asphalt paving, we're friendly competitors. We try not to steal mm-hmm. each other's workers. We try to be respectful. And um, I stood at the Florida Asphalt Expo in Orlando last December, and I told a lot of the competitors in the room that I was given a talk to, I said, I've always told you that I wouldn't hire your workers when they came to the door. I said, after today, I'm going to tell you I'm going to stop start hiring them because I'm tired of them coming and saying, I want to work for you because of the culture you've created. Wow. So yeah. if you don't want them coming to my door anymore, then go back today and change your culture. All right. So it it's a tough workforce, whether you're trying to hire today at Dairy Queen or Target or wherever. So little things like this will separate you. It'll give you a competitive advantage. I hate to say that because that kind of nah, takes the true. meaning off sure. of there. But it'll give you an advantage over the people down the street and it will have an an advantage of that guy wanting to be in your industry for 38 years instead of looking for the next place to go. Um, I, I feel like right now, before we wrap this thing up, I'd like for you to talk to somebody who is struggling. They know they're struggling. They may not understand like you didn't understand until that second or third uh, session with your therapist, what was going on, but they know they need help, but they've never been able to admit it out loud. Would you speak to that person right now who's been hanging on to it for 20 or 30 years? They know that there's something not right, but they're afraid of what people are going to think about them if I admit out loud that I need some help. Would you talk to that person for just a second? Well, one thing you can do in July of last year, there was a new national number, 988. That's 988-988. You can call that. That's the national suicide line, and you don't have to be suicidal. You can call them and talk to them about where you're at and what your struggles are, and they can give you some guidance on placing to go. You should be able to go if, if you have an employer with an EAP program. You should be able to go in confidence to your HR department and ask them for what resources you can have. Um, at our company, we have an app. You can go on 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and you can text a mental health counselor and talk to them free of charge. Our employees can. Um, again, if, if you're religious and go to church, set with your Sunday school leader or, or your pastor. Mm-hmm. If you've, if you've got a phenomenal brother or a phenomenal sister, um, if someone is truly your friend and if someone truly loves you, and if someone truly cares about you, they're not going to be judgmental of you if yeah, you say you're struggling. Right. You don't have to worry about what they're going to say next when you say, I'm struggling. Yeah. If they really love you, you don't have to worry about what they're going to say next. Yes. And I didn't have that person in my life for a long time. Um, I also want to just point out, you just made a very important statement like you should at your workplace have somebody that you can talk to and it won't come back on your job. And I'm just going to add this. If you don't have that person in your workplace, challenge your workplace. If they are not willing to find a person like that in your workplace, stop working for them and go work somewhere else. Yeah. Um, because you should be able to admit at work, at home with a friend, hey, I'm struggling. And it's the people that don't have the ability to admit it or don't have anybody to admit it to that can really get in a low place. So once again, Vince, uh, you got a lot of responsibility. You got a lot of uh, things clamored for your time. Thank you for spending about an hour with us on this episode, talking about the courage that it took for you to stand up and say, hey, I was there too, and there's no shame in it. Let's just get you the help that you need if you're struggling with some mental health problems. That sums it up great. I mean, you said it. (laughs) All right, man. It's been great having you on this episode. God bless. All right. Thank you. While he was talking, Vince just uttered a challenge to everybody listening to this episode who has somebody in your life that maybe things are not going right with him. And you're thinking to yourself, man, I don't want this to be weird. I don't want to have an awkward conversation with somebody. Well, Vince challenged us 
He challenged me and I hope you felt this challenge too. You have two choices at that moment. You can either have a hard conversation now or regret not having a hard conversation later. So if there's somebody in your life that is struggling and you've noticed and things aren't right with them and you're just not exactly sure how to start this hard conversation, well, just go start it and have the hard conversation now because you very well might, and I'm being literal now, save their life. I just wanna say thank you to Vince for being so courageous that he's willing to stand up in front of hundreds or thousands of people and admit, I struggled and it's okay if you're struggling too, go get the mental health that you need. I wanna thank you for tuning into this episode. By the way, if you wanna go back and listen to that Jason McKenzie episode, all you gotta do is look back in the previous episodes at Jason McKenzie's powerful story about how he got courageous and started talking about what this did to his life as well. We've got some pretty amazing people that stay connected with us uh, every episode. And the fan of the week for this week is not just a fan, but she is a former guest on the podcast. Thank you, Candace Bryant, for being such a great fan and follower of this podcast. And we still think you're an amazing lady. Thanks for giving us your time and doing an episode of this in the past. If you found this podcast and you like what you heard, why don't you subscribe? If you're not already following us on social media, just go out there and search at Unbeatable Podcast just about anywhere. And we want to help. I mean, we really do want to help. If you're struggling and you just need some motivation to help you make it through a really rough patch in your life right now, I've got a free PDF for you. It is page after page of just ideas and quotes and little motivational thoughts. I call it the survival guide. And this is a free gift to everybody that's part of the unbeatable army. If you don't know what the unbeatable army is, it's just a group of people that are connected to each other, connected to this podcast. I send them content all week long. And if you want to become part of the unbeatable army, it's totally free for you. I'll even send you or give you access to the survival, the unbeatable army survival guide. All you got to do is just go to unbeatablearmy.com. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Unbeatable with my guest, Vince Hayfley. God bless.